Hi there. This is the review video for midterm one. I have taken all the handouts for the first seven classes and selected the most important slides and included them here in this video. I will not give a complete description about each video, but I'll hit the highlight, the most essential point, the point you're likely to be tested on. From the video lecture material, 99% of the questions will come from this particular video. We'll discuss other questions and how you might best use this to study for the test in class on Wednesday, February 12th. Okay, starting with lecture one. The first point, major point is that DNA is the linear repository of information that guides the development of all organisms. The biological code equivalent to the ones and zeros used in computers are the four bases A, C, T, and G. Cells can replicate the DNA information using a templated synthesis. Since there are two strands in the double helix, one complete strand will serve as the template for synthesis of a new strand. The information is preserved by ensuring that complementary base pairs are included. Wherever there's a C, a G will be incorporated. Wherever there's a T, an A will be incorporated and so on. DNA replication is semi-conservative. That's a term that for the original DNA double helix with two parent strands, both daughter cells will receive one of the original strands and one of the new strands. DNA makes RNA makes protein. This represents the flow of information into action inside a cell, and this is referred to the central dogma of biology, a term coined by Francis Crick in the very early days of modern biology. DNA contains all the information for all the tissues of your body in order to respond to all known environments. The particular choice of genes that it chooses to activate at any one time in any one place is performed through the process called transcription, where DNA is incorporate is transcribed into RNA. Each of these molecules replicate the information stored in the DNA. Most of these molecules will serve as information to code for protein, which is synthesized by the ribosome as it reads the messenger RNA. Humans have slightly greater than 20,000 genes. For the test, you can write down 20,000, you can write down 25,000, you can write down any number in between. We won't ask for a range. Minimal free-living cells require at least 500 genes for self-sustained life. Particles such as viruses, which some people claim represent a, for of, a form of life, can get by with many fewer genes, as little as three in fact, but it hijacks normal cellular machinery in that case to get all of the functions it needs to done. Review material from lectures two and three which I've combined because of the snow day. This shows the relative scale of some important benchmark energies in biology. Average thermal motion at the temperature of life is about 0.6 kilocalories. Hydrogen bonds and other non-covalent bonds in aqueous environments are 1 to 3 kilocalories. Hydrolysis of an ATP molecule can produce 12 to 13 kilocalories. A carbon-carbon single bond is about 83 kilocalories, and when a cell completely oxidizes glucose down to carbon dioxide, it can extract around 680 kilocalories, most of which is stored in the form of ATP molecules. Biology is primarily based upon the chemistry of carbon, and in particular organic carbon. These are a couple different ways of representing those carbon molecules. In this case, hydrogens are not listed. In this case, a carbon molecule is at each node with the assumption that as many hydrogens are present at any location as needed to give carbon tetravalency. This is a, an example of a saturated heart hydrocarbon which could be the equivalent of a fatty acid tail and molecules like benzene with double bonds have a resonance structure and are planar. 
Hydrogen bonds is a type of bond that's especially prevalent in biology. In aqueous environments, hydrogen bonds are 1 to 2 or slightly more kilocalories, depending on the immediate environment of the molecule. Hydrogen bonds are important for the structure of water, proteins, and DNA. Although hydrogen bonds are spoken of as sometimes as being something out of the ordinary, we can see because of partial positive and negative charges due to differences in electronegativity of the oxygen and the hydrogen atoms that hydrogens have partial positive charges and oxygen atoms have partial negative charge character. After that, hydrogen bonds fall out of simple considerations of normal electrostatics. There is an attraction between the negative partial negative charges and the partial positive charges and a linear conformation is adopted to minimize repulsion between these negative charges and these negative charges. Molecules can be classified as either hydrophilic or hydrophobic depending on their solubility in water. Charged mo molecules or atoms or polar molecule are well solvated by water. They can participate in hydrogen bonding and electrostatic interactions and they dissolve thoroughly throughout the solution. Hydrophobic molecules cannot participate in hydrogen bonding interaction and lack polar constituents or dipole moments. Therefore, water does not interact with the molecule. And in fact, water molecules are highly constrained in the orientations they can adopt around such molecules. This constraint of conformations decreases en entropy, which raises the energy of the system. And in order to minimize energy, hydrophobic molecules, hydrocarbons in particular, will try and cluster together to minimize the surface area that's exposed, the surface area between the hydrocarbon molecules and the aqueous molecules. And as we use many times in this class, there are two basic, very basic rules of thumb, which we use over and over in our thermodynamic reasoning. One is that opposite charges attract, like charges repel, and oil and water don't mix, which we use as shorthand to indicate that hydrophobic molecules tend to partition away from hydrophilic molecules. From these two simple rules, many biological phenomena can be rationalized. We also discussed four major types of biopolymers. The first are sugars, which can combine into polysaccharides, which among other things are energy, efficient energy stores inside the body. Sugars are comprised of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, often in the ratio of C1H2O1. And here we see two examples, six carbon sugars, a, a six carbon sugar like glucose, either in the linear form or the cyclic form, or a five carbon sugar, in this case ribose, which is the sugar used in RNA molecules. Ribose is a five membered ring with one oxygen and four carbons. The fifth carbon sits above the ring. Glucose is a six membered ring with one oxygen and five carbons, and the sixth carbon also lies above the ring. The stereochemistry of the hydroxyl groups are very important for sugar function and utility. And in this example, comparing glucose and galactose, the only difference is the stereochemistry at this carbon. But this greatly changes what metabolic pathways galactose can take part in. Fatty acids are one of the primary constituents of lipid bilayers. Fatty acids can connect to a glycerol backbone through ester linkages and a third hydroxyl group will connect to a phosphate group and some hydrophilic head group. In this case, phosphatidylcholine is one of the most predominant lipids in, bio, in eukaryotic human biological membranes. In this example, there is a saturated linear fatty acid and an unsaturated kinked fatty acid. In general, saturated fatty acids can pack more closely Membranes with a lot of unsaturated fatty acids tend to be more flu fluid. Then these phospholipids will spontaneously form into a bilayer with the hydrophilic heads interacting with the water and the hydrophobic tails buried on the inside away from the water and interacting with each other. 
Then to avoid exposing the sides of the lipid bilayers to water, this will spontaneously form a, a spherical shape, completely isolating the hydrophobic tails from water exposure. Because this process is driven by the hydrophobic effect, this process is entropically driven. Amino acids are the subunits of proteins. An amino acid has three atoms, which are part of the protein main chain, or backbone, a nitrogen of an amino group, an alpha carbon to which side chains are attached, and a carbon is part of a carboxy group. In solution, these amino acids are zwitter ions, meaning you have a positively charged and a negatively charged. Overall, the molecule is neutral, but there's these two charges there. The 20 different side chains define the 20 different amino acids. And here they are, and you do have to remember the category to which each of these belongs. There are 10 hydrophobic, or other, or also called nonpolar amino acids. There are five polar, but uncharged amino acids. And there are five charged amino acids. Aside from remembering that lysine is positively charged, you don't need to remember the charges. Amino acids are joined together by peptide bonds, where an amino, a new amino acid will displace the hydroxyl group of the carbonyl, forming a peptide bond between amino acid 1 and amino acid 2. This peptide bond is planar because of a resonance structure with double bond character between the carbon and nitrogen, so that means it, there's no rotation around this bond. There is rotation around these other two bonds, phi and psi, are the angles that describe their orientation, as indicated here. Protein structure can be described at four different levels. The primary structure is the linear sequence, the primary structure of this example is methionine, aspartic acid, leucine, and tyrosine. Secondary structure are common regular folds, which can occur for a wide variety of sequences. This is the alpha helix. This is the beta sheet. There is significant backbone hydrogen bonding between the beta sheet and between, uh, again, backbone atoms in the alpha helix. The tertiary structure is the final complex fold of a monomer. Here you see sub subdomains, you see alpha helices, you see the beta sheets, and the loop structure of the, the intervening sequences. Finally, the quaternary structure refers to the fact that protein monomers can interact in a multi-complex unit. A wide variety of forces contribute to the stability of folded proteins. Salt bridges or ion pairs um, interact by simple electrostatics. Opposite charges attract. There are van der Waals interactions between any sets of atoms here highlighted by hydrophobic methyl groups interacting with each other. Hydrogen bonds, as we know, is a special case of electrostatics, and you can also have disulfide bonds between methionine groups, which is not pictured here. Hydrogen bonding is a constraint on the final folded structure. Every, essentially every atom that can hydrogen bond needs to be hydrogen bonded in the folded structure because in the unfolded shape there's nothing preventing any hydrogen bondable group from interacting with water. Since all atoms are hydrogen bonded here and all atoms are hydrogen bonded here, there is no driving force based on hydrogen bonding. The main force for protein folding or driving force is the packing of hydrophobic residues into the interior of the folded protein, limiting the interaction of nonpolar side chains with the aqueous solvent. DNA is made up of nucleotides four different ones for DNA, G, A, T, and C. These are the bases, also sometimes called nitrogenous bases. There are two purines and two pyrimidines. DNA is always synthesized in the five prime to three prime direction. That refers to the three prime carbon of the ribose, deoxyribose ring and the five prime carbon and new nucleotides will, it, will join the phosphodiester linkage to this hydroxyl group. 
You can tell this is DNA for two reasons. One, there's no hydroxyl group that's making it a deoxyribose sugar, and the fact that T is used instead of uracil. This shows the, a phosphodiester linkage. Originally, this was a hydroxyl group, and this was a hydroxyl group, and now there is a phosphate unit that helps bridge the two sugars. The three basic parts of a nucleotide is the nitrogenous base, the sugar, and the phosphate. The backbone of the, sugar, of the DNA molecule is a sugar phosphate backbone. Since phosphate is negatively charged, DNA can also be described as a polyanion. These are the five total bases, four for DNA, cytosine, thymine, adenine, and guanine, and in RNA, uracil is taking the place of thymine. This slide highlights the sugar that's in the backbone, ribose for ribo ribonucleic acid, and deoxyribose for DNA. Five-membered rings with four carbons and one oxygen, and the fifth carbon sitting up. Some proteins are part of large families that are evolutionarily related. Because they at one point shared a common ancestor, their sequences are similar. Because sequences determine the three-dimensional folded structure of a protein, their structures are similar. But because there are some sequence differences due to divergent evolution, indicated in the gray regions here of these two proteins, slight differences in the substrate specificity of the enzymes can occur. It is through this original gene duplication event that allowed for the evolution of new functional capabilities. Protein shape can be controlled by the binding of small molecules. In this case, there's an example of an enzyme complex that is active, or if it binds a small molecule, it is inactive. This small molecule happens to be CTP, the cytosine relative of ATP. And there are lots of negative charges here, so we have added lots of negative charges to the protein structure. And because of the an altered electrostatic force is governing the shape of the protein, it's not at all surprising that a protein can adopt a different conformation, causing it in this case to be inactive. The interesting part about this story is in this case CTP is postulated as a molecule which if there's sufficient amounts of it in the cell it'll be floating around in the media and therefore more likely to bind the protein and inhibit the enzyme which is converting in this case a metabolic intermediate B to a metabolic intermediate X. This is allows the cell to automatically route metabolic flux through this pathway and not divert it through a pathway for which all your needs are currently being satisfied. This process is called negative feedback. In its most basic view of our metabolism, cells will break down complex energy-rich compounds in order to obtain two things. Useful forms of energy, often store, stored in the intermediate of ATP, and monomer, monomeric molecules which are, can be used as building blocks for the biosynthesis of molecules that this particular organism happens to need. Since many of these biosynthetic reactions are energetically unfavorable, we can use the energy extracted in ATP to power those reactions. The increased order formed inside a cell is not a violation of the second law of thermodynamics because this order is created at the expense of a large amount of disorder out in the environment. The second law of thermodynamics applies only to the system as a whole, and so net order is decreased in all reactions. In enzyme-catalyzed reactions, there are reactants and products, the relative amount at equilibrium is based on the delta G between the reactant and product, with the more energetically stable molecule X predominating. The delta G difference also determines the direction of spontaneous chemical reaction. Here we see an uncatalyzed reaction with a large activation energy and an ca enzyme-catalyzed reaction with a smaller activation energy. This in 
indicates that the reaction will happen more quickly as indicated by the multiple arrows versus a slow reaction. However, as you can see, the relative amounts of reactant and product are not affected because the enzyme is not changing the delta G difference between the reactant and the product. We gave an example of how enzymes reduce the activation energy. We pointed out that amino acids individually have dipole moments present in them and that in an alpha helix these dipole moments will will add vectorially to a large di electric dipole which in this case can be focused at a hypothetical active site. We have also invoked a hypothetical reaction mechanism, a bond cleavage, and a, bond, a transition state for a bond cleavage is a lengthened single bond. Because it's lengthened, there's not enough electricity there, so a partial positive charge will uh, appear in the center of this potentially breaking bond, and the negative ends of the dipoles will help stabilize a positive charge. That is one way that an activation energy, the energy of a transition state can be reduced through electrostatic interaction between negative and positive charges. Continuing with material from lecture four. As we've already mentioned, three parts to a DNA double helix is phosphate, sugar, and base. There are two strands that are anti-parallel, meaning the three prime directions are anti-parallel, and this adopts a right-handed helical twist with a major groove where you have good access to the sides of the bases and a minor groove, which there is a slightly smaller access to the sides of the bases. The bases themselves, G, base pairs with C with three hydrogen bonds, A base pairs with T with two hydrogen bonds. This is These hydrogen bonds ensure complementarity. They ensure information preservation during replication. But as you know well by now, hydrogen bonds do not contribute to the overall stability of the double helix because all of these hydrogen bonds are more than happy to be hydrogen bonded to water as single chains. The energy for interaction for DNA is the driving forces built on stacking forces. As these bases are rotated and stack on top of each other, you're increasing the van der Waals interactions between these bases. Your DNA is organized into chromosomes. There are 22 autosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes. Women are XX, males are XY. Chromosomes are ordered from largest to smallest. They are aligned by the, at their centromeres. The smaller arms are always depicted on top. Those are the P arms. The longer arms are always on bottom. Those are the Q arms. This banding pattern, which is essentially conserved by all people, it represents different states of compaction of the DNA in the chromosomes. The dark areas are very tightly wound. They exclude a fluorescent dye from their midst and so they don't emit light and are dark. Most of the genes in these regions are turned off, a partial consequence of their higher compactness. The light regions are more open, they're called euchromatin, the dark regions are heterochromatin, and genes are, can, can be active in these regions. The appearance of your total set of chromosomes is referred to as your karyotype. More modern methods for identifying chromosomes don't rely on banding patterns, but on tools called molecular paint or chromosomal paints. And there are probes which will bind specifically to different chromosomes, emitting a different color, allowing it a relatively simple matter to align up all chromosomes, and also giving the extra visual clues if a translocation has occurred, because then you'll start to see colors mixing on a single chromosome. I have already been through this point, but it is important to remember. Genes are arranged linearly on the chromosomes. However, as you know, there's lots of non-coding space and only a small portion of the chromosomes actually code for protein. This is a sample gene where there are nine little red exons which are depicted. These are the coding regions 
The large gray areas are intervening sequences, they're introns, and then there are regulatory sequences which help control the transcription of the gene. This can be called a, an operator or a promoter. Together, the operator, exons, and introns of all genes on your chromosomes represents about 20% of the sequence, and the actual coding part, just the red sections here, represent about 2% of your genome. The genes can exist on either strand, and in humans there's no particular relation, functional relationship between genes which are located next to each other on the chromosome. This part of the slide highlights that it's all raw sequence that's the same, and in this hypothetical example, computational methods or experimental methods have determined, again hypothetically, that the yellow regions are exon coding and the non-colored sequence is the intervening sequences, highlighting 2% for protein coding, approximately 20% for all gene-related sequences. Over 50% of your genome is repeated sequences, not unique. Functions are basically poorly characterized, if there are any. I happen to believe there are lots, but this is an area of interest, uh, active research. And 30% of your chromosome is not repetitive, but it does not code for, for genes. As we've discussed, it's, it's not the three hydrogen bonds between G and C that makes GC-rich DNA more stable than two base pairs, two hydrogen bonds of AT. It is the additional heteroatoms on this part of the ring of these two purines which allows greater stacking energy when the bases sit on top of each other for G's and C's. There are three essential parts to every chromosome. We'll start with talking about the centromere, which is the center of the chromosome. It's the portion where kinetochore pro proteins bind, microtubules, where allowing them to segregate during mitosis and meiosis. There are replications of origin, special sequences which allow proteins that will start the replication process to enter. It'll melt this region, causing a bubble, and then new sequences can be synthesized. There must be replications of origin on either side of the centromere because a replication bubble will not cross here. And humans have many origins of replication on each arm of the chromosome, not all of which need to be used each round. The last essential element is a telomere, which is a re short repeated sequence which can adopt specific structures and bind specific proteins that protect the ends of chromosomes from degradation by nucleases or inappropriate joining of ends by repair proteins. The word chromatin refers to the DNA material and all bound protein. The primary protein bound to DNA are histones. There are an eight subunit um, complex at the center of what's referred to as a nucleosome. This is a nucleosome. The DNA plus the, the protein for one subunit. The eight subunits are two copies each of four histone proteins. The DNA going around one and close to two times is about 180 base pairs. And each of these histone proteins has a tail, so there are eight histone tails which will wrap around the DNA and bind it tightly. You're not responsible for these higher levels of packaging of chromatin. The histone tails which grab the DNA has a large number of lysines. Lysines are positively charged. Here's a positively charged. It interacts strongly with the negatively charged DNA via electrostatic interactions. This causes a very tight, tart, tight binding between the... This electrostatic interaction causes a very tight binding between the positively charged amino acid and the negatively charged DNA. This makes it hard for the histone proteins to be loosened, allowing greater access to polymerases, for instance, to transcribe a gene. So in this kind of situation, genes are mostly turned off. If you acetylate the nitrogen at the end of lysine, here's the nitrogen, 
you acetylate that with an acetyl group here, that destroys the positive charge. Now you have a neutral amino acid interacting with negatively charged DNA. There's no great electrostatic interaction between formal charges. This greatly reduces the energy of interaction between these two. In cases where most of the histones are acetylated, their genes tend to be turned on because they're more accessible to the transcription machinery. There are three main principles in describing evolution and the mechanisms. That there is some variation within a population, if only by mutation. Those, that variation is differentially reproduced. It's often sometimes described as a fitness advantage to a particular environment. And whatever the causes of these, the variation, it has to be able to be inherited. Over time, you will eventually produce a result with an altered composition as the result of evolution. The variation itself can be random. Mutations happen without regard to a specific outcome, but it's the differential reproduction that allows a particular set of base pair changes predominate in populations at later times. Two ways of classifying organisms are can use physical similarities or nucleic acid similarities. In some ways they're interrelated because nucleic acid differences can produce different structures or similarities can produce similar structures. And this example further emphasizes the fact that more important sequences tend to be conserved better. And here you have an exon and an intron, and as you go further and further away evolutionarily, you can see that even in pufferfish, the exon sequence is conserved uh, with that that exists in chimps and humans, but that the intronic regions, there's almost no sequence homology. Towards the end of lecture three, we saw the example of two related proteins, elastase and chymotrypsin, that are both proteases with similar functions, but slightly different, that evolved from a common ancestor. This slide shows that again, using the example of globin genes. As you know from your glo lab, globin genes are genes that bind oxygen and transport it. And at one point in evolutionary history, Organisms had only a single type of globin gene. This single globin gene had one affinity for oxygen, which had to make do and serve all the oxygen carrying functions for that organism. Any fine tuned affinity for oxygen had to represent a compromise between all the needs of the cell. If there's a mutation here and you change the affinity of oxygen, there might be times when this protein would simply not work. But after a gene duplication event, which occurs by accident during a replication process, now you have two copies of the globin gene, and you're allowed to start diverging both copies so that, a for instance, a wider range of oxygen-carrying capabilities could be utilized. Further gene duplication events can even specialize more greatly the oxygen carrying abilities of any organism. But if we focus on this primary event, you can again imagine that the ancestral protein had a certain oxygen binding affinity and that an alpha might specialize after, after gene duplication, an alpha subunit might specialize in lower oxygen tensions and a beta chain might specialize at higher oxygen tensions. The combined work of the two of them covers more efficient oxygen carrying capability over a wider range. Gene duplication allows the cell to experiment with these changes because it always has a second copy that is available should a change cause a big problem for the cell in one of the copies. These gene duplication events become fixed in our genomes if they offer a selective advantage towards reproduction, if it benefits the organism in that particular environment, then those organisms that have the duplicated set of genes can prosper. 
primate evolution diverged from other mammals about 65 million years ago, about the time of the extinction of the dinosaurs. Approximately 45 million years ago, the old world monkeys and new world monkeys diverged, with the last of the hominoids diverging from our line about 18 million years ago. Somewhere around 10 million years ago, humans and chimpanzees diverged from gorillas, and approximately 7 or 8 million years ago, humans and chimpanzees diverged. At this point in time, about 2 out of every 100 base pairs are different between humans and chimpanzees. For frame of reference, between two humans, approximately 1 out of 500 base pairs are altered. However, for most of these 7 million years, humans and monkeys were very similar. It's only in the last 100,000 years or so ago where humans have taken this great leap forward. Especially around 60,000 years ago, you start to see new types of behavior, and it's postulated that the genetic changes that are responsible for the human great leap forward are changes in our ability to communicate with spoken words and a richer variety of sounds that may have occurred because of changes in the vocal cords. We resume, continue with lecture five. DNA replication occurs in a five prime to three prime direction. New nucleotides will be added here. Each base that's being brought in for possible addition to the growing strand has to satisfy the complementarity of the existing template strand based on the hydrogen bonding code. Four requirements of DNA replication include a template, which we just saw, the fact that it goes in the five prime to three prime direction. There needs to be a primer. I'll go back to the picture here. There needs to be a primer portion because the nucleotide has to be added to something. And finally, there needs to be an origin site where replication can initiate. Here we see the or origin site that exists at the center of a replication bubble. These are two time points, an earlier time and a later time. As you can see at a later time, the replication fork has moved outwards. It was here, now it's here. The red sequences are the newly sequences, newly synthesized sequences, and that replication forks or bubbles are bidirectional. This is occurring on both sides. And then eventually, as the replication bubble hits the end of the chromosomes, then you'll have two du two, a duplicated pair. Because DNA is always synthesized from 5' prime to 3', prime, and the template strands are anti-parallel, the DNA synthesis mechanisms will be anti-parallel. You'll have a leading strand, two leading strands in a replication bubble, and lagging strands, which synthesize a strand of DNA, jump ahead, synthesize back, jump ahead, synthesize back, jump ahead, synthesize back, jump ahead, synthesize back. Each of these fragments has a little RNA primer, which is degraded, and then finally a ligase enzyme will stitch these little pieces together. This is a blow up of a replication fork. You have a helicase, which is going to unwind the DNA as it's the replication fork moves forward. On the leading strand, you have DNA polymerase with a sliding clamp. On the lagging strand, you have DNA primase, which is an, actually an RNA polymerase. It has the ability to put down nucleotides without a primer. This RNA primer will serve as a primer for DNA. Here we see the example of RNA, and now you're extending it for DNA on it. Eventually the RNA will be chewed up, and the smaller strands connected by ligase. The name for these short fragments on the lagging strand are called Okazaki fragments, and that's something that you need to memorize. The problem with DNA replication at the ends of chromosomes is made apparent in this picture. Here you have a chromosome, you have three origins of replication, three replication bubbles. They collide here and they complete the synthesis. And one strand, the leading strand, goes right out to the very end. The problem is on the lagging strand where nucleotides will jump ahead and then fill back in, but you can't jump far enough ahead to fill it into the very end. 
The way cells early in development or immortalized cells deal with that is by a ribonucleotide protein complex called telomerase. Telomerase is, has a protein component and an RNA component. The RNA component can serve as a primer for DNA synthesis. The, the RNA fragment is complementary to the telomere repeat units, which is a, it's a hexanucleotide repeat unit. And now when telomerase is there, it's going to add on additional repeats on the template strand, allowing the, in order to extend that strand, and now allowing DNA polymerase to go jump ahead and create another Okazaki fragment sealed in the normal end, but at least you've gone far enough for how far the initial chromosomal length was. Over time, telomerase starts working, it stops working in adult cells, the ends of DNA get smaller, and this can trigger either a cell cycle arrest or apoptosis. There are types of organisms that don't use DNA for the genome. Retroviruses are a particular class of viruses that use that have RNA genomes, and HIV is one such retrovirus. So how do they replicate their genomes? There's an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which is important biologically and very important biote biotechnologically because it allows us to synthesize a DNA molecule, which is an information copy of the RNA genome. Eventually, after making a first strand of DNA, there is a process called second strand synthesis, and now you have a DNA duplex. In the case of how the genome is replicated, though, this viral DNA duplex will be incorporated into the host organism's genome and eventually be utilized, utilizes the cellular machinery to make protein, RNA and protein. In this case, three different types of proteins involved with the packaging of new HIV virus particles. The discovery of reverse transcriptase shows that information can flow from RNA to DNA, a fact that was not previously appreciated by the central dogma of biology, which is DNA makes RNA makes protein. There are a number of different ways whereby DNA mutations can occur. One is by improper synthesis. It happens only rarely, but sometimes an incorrect base can be incorporated and be preserved in the DNA double helix despite the cell's efforts to repair such a mismatch or a bulge. Another form of uh, cause of mutations is direct damage, chemical, physical, or photochemical, which for instance can, could cleave the glycosidic linkage between the deoxyribose sugar and the nitrogenous base. The most common form of DNA damage is thymine dimer. You can also refer to it as a thymidine dimer, which ultraviolet light can cause a cyclization reaction between these double bonds on adjacent thymine residues. Now we have two bases which act as one because they're covalently bound. The synthesis mechanisms are extremely precise. There are only a very small number of mistakes are made. One mis mistake is made every 10 to the ninth base pairs. However, that's still large enough to mean that there's going to be at least three mutations every time a human cell divides. But in addition to the amount of DNA repair that a cell has to do, there are many DNA damaging events that occur every day which the cell has to be sure to be able to repair. The numbers can be staggering. For instance, single strand breaks, 55,000 events per cell per day. You have 1 times 10 to the 12th cells in your body, so you have something like 1 times 10 to the 16th single strand breaks per day in your body that all need to be repaired. There are the cell uses different kinds of repair mechanisms for different kinds of DNA damage. We'll look at three of them. The first is base excision repair, which the cell uses when there's a single base affected. 
One such type of damage is when cytosine is deaminated. This will leave a base that looks exactly like a U, which is a uracil, which is a common base found in RNA, but not in DNA. Uracil looks like a T, and so when being replicated, the cell would incorporate an A base across from a uracil, so that would lead to a mutation. Fortunately, there's a protein called uracil DNA glycosylase, which scans DNA, looking for your, specifically looking for uracils in DNA. And when it finds it, it will cut it out, removing the base. Next, there's an enzyme which will look for, for pieces of DNA without a base, and it will cut the backbone, allowing polymerase to fill it in with this, the proper C, which is opposite G, and then ligase would seal the neck thus repairing the original DNA damage, which was deamination. Another repair mechanism is called nucleotide excision repair, and this is used when two or a few bases are affected. We saw thymidine dimers earlier, which occurred as a result of sunlight. This type of damage that's depicted here is a more general case of a pyrimidine dimer. Instead of a second T, it's a cytosine but the inappropriate cyclization reaction occurs, forming crosslinks here, and now instead of two individual bases, you have one large uninterpretable piece of DNA. There is a special kind of nuclease which recognizes this kind of damage, and it will cut widely on either side of the lesion, and it will remove that entire section of single-stranded DNA with assistance from DNA helicase and then DNA polymerase and DNA ligase will complete filling in the second strand with all bases complementary to the template strand. A third type of DNA repair is called double strand break repair using homologous recombination. Double strand break repair is a particularly difficult type of damage to repair because there is not always a clear template strand opposite the other part in order to help assist in repairing. Since the other strand is not available for template, what the cell decides to do is to use the other chromosome uh, as a template for repairing the damaged double strand break. So this would be, for instance, the maternal copy of chromosome 1 and this would be the paternal copy of chromosome 1. In this case, parts of the DNA are chewed back to produce blunt ends and then you have the invasion of one of the other strands used as a template repaired and then that template is repairs the second strand. And we'll see this on the next slide. Here you can see the pairing of the homologous chromosome, the strand invasion, the use of the other chromosome as a template, and then resolution of the holiday junction intermediates in order to produce a repaired strand. Although in this case the although in this case the slide is emphasizing uh, crossing over during meiosis, which as we showed earlier was dependent upon the way the holiday junction is resolved. And this is an unfolded holiday junction. If it is cut vertically, you'll see that you have double strand repair. If you cut it horizontally, then you have a crossed over chromosome. Now, if you have a mispaired set of bases and producing a bulge in the backbone, the question is, how do you know which base to repair? which is, and we went through the consequences, if there's no repair, there is 50% mutation of all daughter cells. If the wrong strand is repaired, then you have 100% of all daughter cells being mutated. But it's only if the proper base is repaired, in this case, the book is saying A is inappropriate, then if that is cut out and you put in a C and a C, and then you'll have 100% of non-mutated DNA. So to answer the question, which of the two bases in a bulge is wrong, the cell will scan and look for the strand that has the closest nick 
to the DNA mismatch. The cell assumes that this is the most recently synthesized strand, and therefore that, in this case, the yellow strand was the template strand, and so the red strand will be cut and removed, and it will be repaired using uh, DNA synthesis. A very elegant making, a mechanism for solving a puzzling problem. Now we resume with review from Lecture 6. In Lecture 6, we study the processes of transcription, which is DNA being converted into RNA, and translation, which is RNA being converted into protein. Transcription again occurs when genes in your DNA are turned on. We don't use all genes all the time, and only a subset of them, and they are controlled by a number of factors to be converted into RNA, which can then be converted into protein when they are required by the cell. The amounts that are transcribed or translated can vary from gene to gene, and the amounts are, to a first approximation, almost entirely determined by thermodynamics. If you have a tighter binding site for the RNA polymerase, if you have stronger ribosome binding sites, you will generally produce more of RNA and more of protein. Now to make clear once again the differences between RNA and DNA, you use ribose sugar instead of deoxyribose. That means you in RNA you do have the 2 prime hydroxyl group. You have the base U instead of thymine. It's speculated that you use uracil and RNA as it's a little cheaper to make. It's a little more metabolically expensive to put the methyl group in thymine. However, that methyl group stabilizes thymine in DNA where you want to have long-term storage of the cellular information. But that is a bit of a hand-waving argument. Now, there are many types of RNAs in the cells. We'll study the messenger RNAs, the ribosomal RNAs, and the transfer RNAs in this lecture. In the third part of the course, we'll talk a little bit about microRNAs, but these, the other th first three are the ones you need to know for this test. And they have the functions of coding for proteins, of being an integral biochemical part of the ribosome, and the RNA molecule that converts the RNA code to the uh, amino acid code of proteins. Here we see a picture of the enzyme RNA polymerase. This is the enzyme that synthesizes an RNA molecule from a DNA. It does RNA synthesis using the template strand. The strand that is doing nothing here is referred to as the coding strand of the DNA. The base pair sequence of the RNA will be the same as the base pair sequence of the coding strand because they're both complementary to the template strand. Note, too, that RNA is synthesized in the 5' prime to a 3' prime direction. There are sequences that are encoded in the DNA that help provide the clues about where a gene is and where an RNA polymerase should start transcribing. In particular, in the promoter region, we talk about the TATA sequences, which are within 35 to 40 bases of the transcription start site. And there's also a terminator site, which is the clue for the RNA polymerase to release the RNA and release the DNA. A factor called the sigma factor helps RNA polymerase initiate the synthesis of RNA molecules. After the synthesis of a few nucleotides, 10, 20, 30, the sigma factor will be released and now the RNA polymerase goes much more quickly, and when it hits the terminator sequences, everything is released, and the RNA polymerase is free to start transcription once again. Here is the transcription start site. Here are the 35 bases upstream of the transcription start site, and this was referred to as the TATA -ta box because, because of the predominance of T and A sequences in this region. You'll remember that T and A sequences are lower melting than the high GC rich regions, and so this is an area of DNA which is easier for it to open up in initially, allowing the RNA polymerase to start synthesis off one of the uh, 
off the template strand. It is the Tata binding protein here, TBP, which is part of one of the a generic transcription factor that first binds the RNA. It will recruit other accessory factors and the polymerase to the promoter, many of which will get released when the polymerase starts to transcribe the gene that is being regulated. These accessory transcription factors are different from the sequence gene-specific transcription factors. These are general factors that are used on a large proportion of all genes. The details of these you're not responsible for other than uh, rem remembering about Tata binding protein being the initial binder at the Tata box. There are a number of significant differences between bacterial prokaryotic messenger RNA and eukaryotic messenger RNA, starting with the fact that in eukaryotes, a single RNA molecule is produced per gene. In bacterial cases, there, there is a term called polycystronic RNA, which means that there are several genes that are included in the transcription of a single RNA molecule. This is in part a consequence because in bacteria, Genes are often organized in a structure called an operon, not to be confused with operator, which is part of a promoter or the regulatory sequence, but an operon refers to the fact that genes that are functionally related are often in close physical proximity on the chromosomes, in this case right next to each other. And in fact, these proteins are usually required in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one stoichiometry so that they're made in equal amounts, all originating from the same messenger RNA molecule. Other important differences are that eukaryotics ha eukaryotes have a structure called a 7-methyl-G cap on the 5' prime end of messenger RNA, and they have poly-A tails of runs of about 200 A's bases, which get added on after the synthesis of the mRNA, which helps stabilize the RNA and also helps bind proteins which will help the RNA transport out of the nucleus. The last big difference which we'll see on the next slide is eukaryotes have large introns which separate the exons which are the coding regions. When an RNA is made in eukaryotes the entire length of the RNA is made and then the introns are and that's a immature piece of RNA that a mature RNA has all the intron sequences spliced out of it so that you have only these darker yellow sequences involved as the RNA is being translocated out to the cytoplasm. Since eukaryotes go to the trouble of splicing introns together, they take up the opportunity to occasionally vary the exons which are being incorporated into the protein. This is a straightforward may, way of creating more diversity of protein product from a fixed number of genes. In this case, there are slight functional differences in the tropomyosin gene, which behaves slightly differently in different kinds of muscle or fibroblasts even. And these phenotypic differences are a part of structural differences, which result from alternative splice. This flexibility in terms of exon inclusion speaks to the modularity of protein structure design. Just as there are sequences specifying start and stop sites for transcription, there are also sequences specifying where RNA molecules can be spliced. But there's a little more flexibility in these sequences. For instance, Y stands for either of the two pyrimidines. R stands for any of the two purines. N stands for any nucleotide. The A in the middle is the nucleotide that participates in the chemistry of splice. And since the splicing motif sequences straddle the exon intron boundaries, whenever you join two exons, you have specified three bases, which depending on the reading frame can participate in different amino acids. But this is a sequence constraint in the design of protein sequences across exon boundaries. Now when splicing occurs, there are a lot of proteins involved which 
help hold the portions of the exons in close proximity so that they can be joined together. But the actual nucleophilic chemistry attack is based on a hydroxyl group from an A base, which is doing the chemistry, and then the hydroxyl group will join here, but it is in. The RNA is the molecule doing the chemistry, which means it's acting like an enzyme, which is part of the reason that RNA molecules have been specified as being attractive candidates for the origin of life, because R this shows that RNA molecules can both store information based on their nucleotide sequence and also do certain types of chemistry based on the obvious example that it's performing here. Just a reminder here that RNA molecules are produced inside the nucleus and they are transported out through nuclear pores into the cytoplasm or cytosol where they will encounter ribosomes where they will be translated into proteins. And this slide gives a bit of an overview. First looking at eukaryotes, we have a gene on the DNA sequence which is initially transcribed in as a primary or immature transcript capping, splicing, the addition of the poly A's at the end. This RNA is available for export into the cytosol and the protein is synthesized. In prokaryotes there's no separation, there's no nucleus, so there's no separation between the transcription and translation events and so you can often see this going on simultaneously. The part of the RNA molecule that is made is getting made into a protein even though the RNA molecule is not completely synthesized. When you synthesize an RNA molecule, you have to interpret it three bases at a time because three bases are called a codon and this is what specifies which of the 20 amino acids is going to be coded for. And as you can see, when you are given an RNA sequence or when the cell encounters an RNA sequence, it has to figure out what the coding frame is because if it misses by a base or misses by two bases, you're going to make very different uh, peptides based on the exact same sequence. You'll see that these, all these uh, RNA molecules start with CUCA, CUCA, CUCA. It's just where you make the break which helps determine which of the amino acids would be incorporated based on the sequence. Converting an RNA sequence into protein revolves using one of these tables and I'll go back to the previous slide. In this case CUC stood for leucine. The way we would see that here, the first based in the codon is C, the second is U, the third is C, so that's going to code for a leucine. The third base in the codon is called the wobble position is, and you can see that it matters the least. For many of these cases, if the first two are, bases are C and U, it doesn't matter what the third base is, it's going to be leucine. Likewise, if the first two bases are C and C, it doesn't matter what the third base is, it's going to be proline. And this is something the cell is engineered because there are stronger contacts made between the first two bases to better discriminate among the possibilities. The tRNA molecule here in blue is the an RNA molecule that base pairs with the messenger RNA. However, there are 61 different of these tRNA molecules for the 61 different codons which code for amino acids. Three of the codons are stop codons and that makes a total of 64, which is the number of, th of combinations you can make from three base pairs of four bases each, four times four times four. So anyway, when there is a specific mRNA sequence, there's a specific tRNA that is complementary to it, which it binds, and it carries a pr amino acid with it, which in this case is tryptophan. There are 61 different tRNA synthetase enzymes and these enzymes are responsible for attaching the proper amino acid to the proper tRNA molecule. We've said many times that DNA is synthesized 5' prime to 3'. Prime. The corollary for proteins, proteins are sequenced from the N-terminus 
to the C terminus. You can also say the amino terminus to the carboxy terminus. Amino acids are always added to the carboxy terminus. Here we see a growing polypeptide chain with one, two, three, four amino acids connected to it. Again, the backbone atoms are the amino group, the alpha carbon, and the carboxy carbon. Notice the growing peptide chain is always attached to one amino acid. In this case, the first three amino acids are. And then here, it, all four amino acids are attached to a tRNA molecule. The ribosome is the complex molecular machinery that reads the messenger RNA and synthesizes the protein. This is a very large complex, uh, over four megadaltons. There are approximately um, 80 or so proteins that are involved with this, and there's also four rRNA molecules which are involved. By mass, these four RNA molecules are approximately approximately equal in molecular weight to the 80 proteins. And here we see a structure of the ribosome. Here we see the small subunit. Here we see the big subunit. And this is just the RNA part of the ribosome. There's no protein here. We see three tRNA molecules that are incorporated. One in the E site, one in the P site, one in the A site. This is exit, peptidyl, and aminoacyl sites. In the E site, this tRNA is about to leave. The peptide is attached to the tRNA in the P site. And the A site is, has a tRNA with just a single amino acid attached, where it's going to become part of the peptide. And here we see the sequence. The peptide is attached to a tRNA molecule in the P site. The, amino, the tRNA with the new amino acid is in the A site. There will be a bond transfer from the third tRNA to the fourth amino acid, which is still connected. And now you've grown the polypeptide chain by one step. Then the large ribosomal subunit will translate one step. Then the small ribosomal subunit will translate one step. Then the used tRNA will dissociate. A new tRNA with a new amino acid appropriate for the next codon. Uh, it diffuses into the ribosome and the cycle repeats itself. Just like there was the Tata box, which indicated we should start making RNA at this spot, there are spots internal in the RNA molecule, AUG, which codes for methionine, which indicates the start for translation. All proteins start with the amino acid methionine because they all start with the codon AUG. This AUG is recognized by the small subunit of the ribosome and a special initiator tRNA which helps scan. It scans the RNA molecules and the, until it encounters the proper AUG. It need not be the first AUG. There might be one over here. And it's a bit of a mystery deciphering how the small ribosomal subunit knows which of these AUGs is the proper place to start, but that's for a different matter. Once it is bound to the proper AUG site, then the large ribosomal subunit will come and form the full ribosomal complex. And then the polypeptide synthesis starts as an amino acid appropriate for the next codon diffuses in. And then you have the formation of a peptide bond. And then we'll see translocation or trans, translocation of the ribosome. Because Bacterial RNAs are polycystronic, as we said, because they code for multiple genes and multiple proteins. Uh, on a single RNA molecule, we just point out that there are separate AU start AUGs for each of these pro proteins, and there are ribosome binding sites specific for each of these genes, again, even though this is a single mRNA molecule. And there are three codons which code for end of protein. These are called stop proteins. They have names like amber, ochre, and opal. And there, instead of a tRNA molecule coming into the A site when the sequence occurs, a protein shown here, uh, which is approximate shape of a tRNA molecule, will come in, bind to the codon sequence, and then release 
the peptide, the least, the large subunit, the messenger RNA, and the small subunit completing protein synthesis. This slide makes the point that as the growing polypeptide chain exits the ribosome, it's free to fold both secondary structural elements and even folds that we consider tertiary elements. And this is one of the arguments for why proteins are not necessarily at their thermodynamic maximum. And this is one of the arguments against why folded proteins are not necessarily at their global energetic minimum. They're at a local energetic minimum to be sure, but because the protein gets folded before other parts of the protein are even released, you might be locking in a somewhat suboptimal fold. It's relatively stable, but perhaps it could even be more stable if, for instance, this beta sheet would interact with one of these blue ones, but it never gets the opportunity because it has been trapped kinetically by folding first in this or orientation. So this is a ex potential example of kinetically trapping a thermodynamic intermediate, which is not a global minimum. If proteins get folded incorrectly, they often expose large hydrophobic patches on the surface as opposed to being buried inside a, co a core. The exposed hydrophobic patches interact with chaperone proteins, which help allow proteins to try and refold. By using hydrophobic binding sites, they draw proteins to the interior of the chaperone, giving the protein a chance to refold in isolation, and then it will be released. If a protein is folded correctly, it can go on to pre preserve its function. If it's still incorrectly folded, it will still have hydrophobic regions exposed, and it might very well um, be lured back into the chaperone to try once again. Eventually, an incorrectly folded protein will escape the chaperone and be marked for destruction. The protein complex which destroys or degrades all protein is a complex called the proteasome. And this is, it has a barrel-like structure. Proteins are threaded into the center and there are proteases on the interior which will cleave a lot of the amino acids off of it. The threading process of proteins marked for destruction and is initiated by a polyubiquitin signal which binds the cap regions of the proteasome and then ATP hydrolysis will power the threading of the protein into the center where the protein is degraded by proteases into its constituent amino acids. And this slide is a good summary of the entire lecture and you should check yourself reviewing all these steps to make sure you're familiar with all of it from the very beginning process of making RNA from the DNA to the folded protein at the end of this process. Review slides from lecture seven. In this lecture we studied two main things, how cells make a specific protein and how they make varying amounts of that protein. And we see here at least six control points where cells modulate the final most important quantity which is the amount of an active protein at any given time. Four of these processes, and I won't read them, are involved with regulating RNA levels, either making it or degrading it, and two of these particular levels are involved at the protein level. The fundamental control element of transcription is like a lock and key which requires two basic components a short stretch of a defined DNA sequence and a protein that binds that short stretch of DNA. The protein that binds that stretch of DNA will then eventually recruit other proteins or an RNA polymerase to that site and initiate the transcription of that particular gene. On this slide we're looking straight down the axis of four DNA molecules looking at the four pieces, four possible uh, base pair arrangements. And again, the helix is, here's the helix axis and it's coming right out of the page. Proteins read the bases by coming in through the major groove or the minor groove, groove 
and the protein will be pr probing the different chemical elements that are exposed in the groove in order to determine whether it is the proper binding site for it or what bases are there. As you can see for all four bases, and we'll make it even clearer on the next slide, the chemical arrangements are different, allowing proteins to discriminate amongst the possible bases. Here it is drawn more schematically. Now the DNA helix axis is going up and down, and the proteins which are binding to these uh, bases, in this case G and C, are coming in straight at from up the page. And the schematic of a GC base pair is, according to this key, hydrogen bond acceptor, hydrogen bond acceptor, hydrogen bond donor, and hydrogen atom. And so the protein needs to have complementary amino acid groups to coordinate with those. And as you can see, even in the schematic, there are more chemical elements exposed in the major groove than there are in the minor groove. With the two different types of base pairs being not even fully chemically distinguishable. This schematic shows how a, a protein with an asparagine amino acid can start to interact with an A nucleotide. There would then presumably be another amino acid interacting with parts of these, this T nucleotide. Now, there is no guaranteed code of which amino acids will bind with which nucleotides. There are some statistical preferences, but no one yet is able to predict, um, based on DNA sequence, what protein will be binding there, or at least what amino acids will be used to make that contact. Now, a prominent type of protein family of DNA binding proteins are called zinc finger transcription factors. And there is this protein will interact in three different places in the major groove with a set of DNA sequences. And these zinc fingers, zinc because they all coordinate zinc and they have sort of a finger type shape, will interact with these bases. And one of the, another attractive feature of these three zinc fingers is they are to a first approximation independent. This allows biotechnologists the opportunity to manipulate one of the zinc fingers to change the binding sequence without disrupting the other fingers to quite the same degree as you might in other proteins. This is potentially a useful tool if you want to create a new genetic regulatory circuit if you might want to turn on a specific gene at a certain time. And so there are a large number of biotechnology firms pursuing these types of research efforts. Now the tryptophan repressor is a protein that turns genes off in bacteria and it was an example of negative feedback which interferes with the repressor which will shut the genes off. Now, the tryptophan repressor is the repressor protein that controls the tryptophan operon, which is five different genes all connected in a row that which are functionally related in an operon. They make five different proteins. Tryptophan is an essential molecule for the cell as it's one of the 20 amino acids. The logic is, is that if you don't have tryptophan, a lot of tryptophan lying around the cell, you want to make a lot of it. So you want all these enzymes that are going to help synthesize this molecule. However, if you ha have a lot of tryptophan, then there's no need for these enzymes. There's no need to make more. So excess tryptophan will bind to a, a tryptophan repressor, which can then sit down here on the promoter and block RNA polymerase from binding and making this RNA molecule. And this is the example. If there's not a lot of tryptophan around, the trip repressor is inactive, RNA polymerase sits down on the DNA and makes, tr transcribes a, a pet piece of messenger RNA, which is going to direct the synthesis of those five enzymes. If there is abundant tryptophan around, on average, it will be more likely to bind the repressor 
The repressor will undergo a conformational change. It will bind to the DNA and not allow the RNA polymerase to sit down. You're not going to be making the RNAs. You're not going to be making the proteins because you have enough tryptophan already. The, this is, a, again, an example of an allosteric effect of ligand binding, meaning that the ligand will bind to the protein. It will change the conformational shape. In this case, it spreads out these helices, which can then interact with the major grooves of DNA, allowing it to bind tightly. Without the tryptophan, they're too close. They're not appropriately spaced for both of them to make contact with DNA at the, at the same time. This one might hit the major groove, but then this one bumps into the sugar phosphate backbone. So this was an example of negative feedback regulation for gene regulation. What we saw earlier was the example of the CTP molecule uh, turning protein enzymes off. So this is a negative feedback uh, on a metabolic circuit. This is negative feedback on gene regulation, affecting enzymes, affecting transcription factor, affecting the production of small molecules, affecting the production of transcription of mRNA molecules. We went on to discuss an even more complex case of the LAC repressor, or the lactose operon. In this case, there are a number of genes down here which assist in making enzymes which can metabolize the sugar lactose. However, lactose is only a backup energy source for the much more useful sugar mo molecule glucose. So two conditions need to be satisfied to turn these genes on. You have to have lactose around, but you also have to have no glucose. Because if you have glucose, you don't want to mess with lactose. If lactose is present, it will bind to the lac repressor, and the lac repressor won't bind. So if lactose is present, you're going to have the repressor over here with lactose binding, and it doesn't have the right shape to interact with DNA. So allowing, with the absence of a repressor, in principle, you could uh, transcribe these genes with RNA polymerase. However, this operon also requires an activating protein. This activating protein will only bind when there is no glucose around. If glucose is around, this ligand molecule, which happens to be cyclic AMP, is not present, and so the activating protein is not appropriate for binding to this piece of DNA. So to make the lactose genes, you have to be absent glucose with high levels of C cyclic AMP, allowing the activator protein to bind the sequence, and also the presence of lactose, which is going to release the repressor and allow the polymerase, giving the polymerase free reign to transcribe this operon and the genes needed for lactose utilization. This slide makes the simple point that because binding interactions are based on thermodynamics, there's the potential for synergy and much greater than additive units of transcription when both are binding. As in this hypothetical example, when both of these activator proteins are present, it might, the cell might very efficiently recruit the polymerase to sit down on the DNA and start RNA transcription. Another way to regulate transcription is by interacting with the chromatin to make it more conducive for allowing gene transcription. One of the ways we know to do that is to add acetyl groups to the histone tails. This weakens the interaction with the histone and the DNA, allowing a protein like a polymerase to sit down, loop the DNA away a little bit, and start to read it. And it is surprising, but polymerases are able to transcribe RNA, RNA even while protein is bound. Another way of affecting the chromatin to allow more transcription is by remodeling, which involves with slipping nucleosomes farther distances away so that they're less densely packed, generally creating a more open structure and allowing better access of the polymerase to the sequence that it wishes to transcribe. Now we talked about several different genetic circuits that can help control our protein production. We talked about the positive feedback loop, which 
has the effect that once a protein is made, that's a persistent state. It's an effect, essentially a memory element, and that even when the cell divides, because protein A is being made, protein A will stimulate the synthesis of more protein A. So in fact, you inherit the functional status of this gene, not merely just the information. The initial production of protein A is based on some transient signal, which need not persist because once it has stimulated the synthesis of A, A persists and that drives its own synthesis. There is the toggle switch developed by Jim Collins and Tim Gardner, and in this case the circuit is bistable. You can either make a pr protein 1 or in this case protein 2, and it acts as a bistable switch because if you're making protein 1, you've shut down the production of protein 2. Exactly conversely, if you're making protein 2, you're shutting down the production of protein 1. That state will persist. You're going to make protein 2 as long as you need to until you intervene with an inducer molecule. This inducer molecule breaks the interaction here. It allows repressor 1 to be made, and once repressor 1 is made, now you, it inhibits repressor 2. You no longer need the inducer molecule because the repressor protein itself is doing the inhibition of repressor 2. This is a switchable circuit by adding either inducer 2 or inducer 1, and the analogy we talked about is a light switch where you flip the switch and the lights are on until you decide to switch the light off. The third type of circuit we looked at was a feed-forward loop, and this is a safety design circuit which requires two inputs, both A and B, to drive the synthesis of Z. And the, the reason might be that if Z is an toxic molecule or something very important, you don't want to make it transiently or by mistake. If a mistake is made, usually it's only made for a short time. If you make a small, and here, and here it shows that if you only make uh, protein A for a small amount of time, you're not going to make any Z because in order to get Z, A needs to make B, which takes time, B needs to be made, and then A still needs to be around in enough quantity while B is made to both bind to to the gene for Z at the same time. A long input or a long stimulus will allow A to build up for a long period of time, make some B, give B a chance to accumulate, and then both can bind. Other factors which can affect the levels of transcription of a certain gene are is the methylation status of cytosines in places called CPG islands. These are regions in the promoter that are highly enriched for the CG dinucleotide. There are enzymes which can put a methyl group on a C, which then allows proteins to recognize methylated C, which can bind and can interfere with transcription. Because the methylation status of Cs can be inherited, this is a type of information that is being inherited that is not strictly speaking the ATG sequence. Thus, this is an epigenetic phenomenon. Epi meaning around, genetic meaning genetic. The reason this methylation status is inherited is because DNA replication is semi-conservative. Each cell always gets one of the original strands and one of the newly synthesized strands. When the cell sees a hemimethylated piece of DNA, meaning one of two possible spots, are not methylated, it will go ahead and methylate the second spot. You can ignore this bottom part of the slide. Not only can you inherit the methylation status of cytosines, you can also inherit the status of protein being bound to DNA. If many subunits are bound at a particular locus, the distribution of those proteins when the cell divides can be more or less stochastic. Some proteins will go over here, some proteins will go over here. They will serve as seeds for additional protein to bind the DNA. And now essentially because a few have gone each side, now you replenish the full complement of proteins binding 
at that gene. And in this case, this is these are inhibitory proteins or hypothesized to be inhibitory proteins. And they just show that the result is both of the daughter genes are inactive when the parent gene is inactive and vice versa. Again, methylation and protein status inheritance is referred to as epigenetics. We conclude with four slides on how genetic regulatory circuits are studied. Remember, we have to study, we have to identify both pieces, both the lock and the key. A very straightforward way of identifying DNA sequences to which DNA or proteins can bind is to look for conservation of non-coding sequences. Again, remember, coding sequences, exons, tend to be conserved more because they have a function. If you find a stretch of DNA that is highly conserved across many organisms, there is a chance, a good chance, that that sequence is important and that it is, if in a promoter region, it is being bound by a piece of DNA. This identification of conserved sequences is obviously done computationally after a lot of DNA sequencing has been done. If you are studying a protein and you don't know its function and you wonder if it binds DNA, one thing that can be done is you can take genomic DNA from the organism of interest. You can run it on a gel. You can see it can be randomly fragmented so that can all run rather quickly by adding one protein or multiple proteins that you're interested in. You might see it bind to DNA and now the DNA will migrate less quickly in the gel and it'll be it'll move more slowly and you'll see bands shifting up from this bottom region which is where it migrates in uh, a protein free environment because you're seeing mobility shifts of gel bands this is called gel mobility shift assay or electrophoretic mobility shift assay now another question you might ask is I have a DNA sequence that I'm interested in and I want to find a protein that binds to it. You can do this essentially by the process of affinity purification. That means you take the DNA sequence, you make many many copies of it, you attach it to beads, you put it in a column, and now you can pour proteins over it, in this case total cellular proteins. Um, most proteins will pass right through because they don't interact with your sequence. Some proteins, pardon me, I should have said, you, most proteins will pass right through and because it doesn't interact with DNA. Some proteins will interact with the, your DNA sequence and stay on the column initially, but then by adding a large amount of salt, then you can interfere with this interaction and then elute DNA binding proteins. And you normally need to do a two-step process to get any sort of specificity. Now you take these proteins that seem to stick to the column initially because it, they were harder to get off, and now you pass it through a column again. In this case, you had a generic sequence here. You have the specific sequence you're interested in, and chances are most of the proteins won't bind super strongly to this one sequence but there's some proteins that will bind very tightly to it. And now you have produced an experimental result which is, suggests the hypothesis that this protein binds to this sequence, although that needs to be confirmed using other methods. The final way that we're going to talk about how these genetic regulatory circuits are studied is a method called CHIP-seq, and CHIP stands for chromatin immunoprecipitation. Chromatin is the DNA and the protein complement of the nucleus. And immunoprecipitation means we're going to take an antibody and we're going to yank some of the material out. And I'll be explicit. Let's say we're interested in all the sequences in a genome where regulatory protein A binds. To a living cell, it's going to be sitting down in 10 or 50 or 100 places. We're going to add a little bit of formaldehyde, which is a cross-linking molecule. This is going to cross-link proteins to uh, small sections of DNA, preserving the interaction. And then by using an antibody against the yellow protein, 
we can pull the yellow protein away from all this other material and it's going to drag along certain DNA sequences that it was bound to. Then we can reverse these crosslinks by heating protein going this way, DNA going this way, and now we can amplify the free DNA which will represent all the different places that protein A was binding when we added the formaldehyde. Okay, I know that's a lot, but I know you can handle it. Good luck on the exam.